Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Hartz, and today we are continuing our 32 for 32 series going over the Buffalo Bills, as you all know, and have been listening to this podcast. This has always been a pro Josh Allen corner. It will continue to be so in the future. One of the most entertaining and recently one of the truly best quarterbacks in the league, but obviously it is a team sport and we have plenty more to talk about as the Bills try to rebound from that AFC championship loss. I have a very special guest on to help me do so from WGR Buffalo, longtime veteran of the industry and ace bills analyst mike shope you can find him on twitter at shope talk that's s-c-h-o-p-p talk mike thanks for the time and happy offseason man hey ian i'm glad to be with you uh you were on my show once so i'm happy to return the favor i listen a lot Appreciate that, man. Yes, it's uh, it's good to be on the other side of things. We have uh, plenty to go over here. want to quickly go through the Bills' top three team needs. We'll go through a little gut feel round with some more personnel-based decisions and end things with a hot, bold, bold you know, off-season take. We, we, we want to be bold and hot with everything, but it is what it is uh, before we get Mike out here. So, again, thank you, Mike, for your time, and let's get after it. Mike, top three off-season needs for the Bills ahead of 2021. My guess is it'll be an off season where they try to get better in the trenches and sort of be like a little rootsy, if you will. They just exploded for over 500 points, won 15 games, including the playoffs. They have some free agent departures on the offensive line. Matt Milano, a good linebacker will go. So I think a year after trading for Stefan Diggs and two years after signing John Brown and Cole Beasley and really dressing up the skill positions, I would think offensive line, defensive line, linebacker. And I think cornerback is always right, uh, really, for any team. You saw teams playing more than four DBs, about three quarters of the plays in the league this year. And with Trey White on one side, they're a little short on the other side. So I would say uh, corner is in there, too. I think replacing Milano, offensive line, and then corner, I guess, if you want three. Yeah, cornerback uh, specifically with you know, Levi Wallace and Josh Norman being unrestricted free agents. It's been interesting because I, I write a wide receiver cornerback column every single week. been doing it for years. And Tredavious White, he's certainly capable of holding up in just pure one-on-one -on -one shadow coverage. But particularly this last year, they seem more content just to let him stay on his side. I get it. You know, you don't want to really rearrange your entire defense just for one matchup. But do you think if they are able to maybe use a high draft pick to replace Wallace and Norman, they could get back to using Trey White more on the opposing's number one? Or is it just a situation? situation where you think they like leaving him on the side, letting everyone really know their responsibility. Yeah. You know, they've done some of both under Sean McDermott. I think white is so good that they can afford to be a little stealth when it comes to that. I, I think one exception that we just saw play out firsthand is when you play Kansas city and they have Tyree kill in the slot <laughs> who, you know, that so somewhat mitigates white's value in his role. And then what Travis Kelsey is now, of course, those are two players that most teams can't handle. Yeah but I don't think the bills are perfectly equipped there. And they're in a position where if they're feeling a little bit, shall we say cocky about their position in the AFC East, they might really pinpoint what Kansas city is yeah. and try to build reinforce this off season for that opponent. They'll play them again in the regular season. They'll hope to play them in the playoffs. Probably. I mean, the chiefs, it doesn't have to go this way, but the chiefs look so strong and with Mahomes there, I mean, that could be a matchup nightmare for, teams for a long time that they want to specifically almost like you're in the same division with them yeah. where you want to try to build for that. So I, I just think it's the trend of the league. It's where the bills are soft, relatively speaking. It's a pretty well-balanced and good team. So I think they, they um, corner makes sense for a lot of reasons. And to be the best, you got to beat the best. So it makes sense to really try to take away what the Chiefs do. Great. I think it's a great comp because you also look at the Bills and just kind of how they devote resources on defense. I remember in that first Chiefs game, everyone's going, oh, how do you let Clyde Edwards-Alaire run, run all over you? They made a conscious decision that, hey, let's try to take the ball out of Patrick Mahomes' hands and dare them to run. And because of that, we kind of saw them have, you know, bad run defense numbers. But it was more because they were playing the pass in the year 2020, 2021. That makes sense. So when I look at, you know, the interior defensive line and you know just not having you know a ton of you know true just I guess uh high name ballers out there are you with me is that this is more of a thing where they should be putting more pieces in the secondary and if teams could want to run the ball let them do it I think so I was fine with how they played that first game yeah and they did hold the Chiefs under 30 points in the end so it was especially it made it especially disappointing what happened in the rematch yeah. uh because there were like there was no pressure on the quarterback and it just it was just not not good enough I want to, I'm a, more of a numbers guy. I want to give this team a lot of credit for what it built this year. The record speaks for itself. 
And, and part of that is how on defense, they were mu much more intent on stopping the pass. I think that's the way to go. So I would like to think that continues. If other teams want to run the ball for five yards of play on me, I really don't care. <laughs> I don't mind. Let them keep doing it. Sean McDermott kind of dared Kansas City in that first game to do it, and the Chiefs did and ended up breaking team records for Andy Reid records for how often they ran the ball. So I, I want to think this team is like that. I think safety could be interesting, by the way, here, because with Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer, they're getting a little older. And so maybe the Bills would like to somehow find their way to a more – physical, bigger, faster, some more, sort of like the new, more of a new breed at safety, as good a, and smart as Hyde and Poyer have been. So, yes, in terms of their defense, I, I would approach it that way. I would try to reinforce the back end uh, for all those reasons. Yeah, and it, literally, like, if you look at just any sort of kind of defensive chart where you just have overall pass and run defenses, you'll notice best pass defenses, also the best overall defenses. Again, you're not making money these days to stop the run. Last point before you get on the gut field round, you talked about the offensive line. And, you know, I, I think in 2019 when they added John Brown and Cole Beasley, that almost kind of took most of the media attention. What they also did was just really address that offensive line, and they built, you know, not – maybe not juggernaut, but at least a very good unit that even with Josh Allen holding the ball as long as he does – They've kept him upright more times than not. Looking ahead to 2021, I mean, just via over the cap, the Bills have the fourth fewest 2021 dollars devoted to the offensive line. Darrell Williams, a free agent. We got guards, Brian Winters, John Feliciano, and Bodiger. Do you think this is a situation where, you know, with Josh Allen's contract obviously coming up and, you know, having digs on the payroll now, are they going to have to try to, you know, not completely rebuild, but at least add resources to this offensive line through the draft? Probably. Uh, and they're going to draft late. So we'll see how they do. I mean, they're losing a couple of starters, it, it would seem, up front. And you also have age considerations that always happen. And what I really don't know yet, is, maybe hardly anybody knows yet, is what kind of league effect with the relative drop in revenues we'll see yeah. teams have to deal with when it comes to the cap. They all might end up feeling like they're a little bit short. Yeah. So I would think um, they, they'll want to be better there. I, I think offensively they're a really interesting team to consider for this offseason because they threw the ball so great and there is still that especially here like it's existed here for many years in the rex ryan teams and sean mcdermott for three of his four years that they said it after the season predictably run the ball better let's just hope that doesn't mean run the ball more because <laughs> usually when you run it better you'll want to run it more and so if these guys found their way to uh like a known running back um, hopefully out of the draft with the other things we've talked about, but offensive line road graders type, I would not be shocked. I'd be a little disappointed, but I would not be shocked if that was the direction they go. When we get to a bold call, I got a, I got a name in mind <laughs> for, uh, for that point. There we go. I like it. But yeah, I mean, and you know, you mentioned before, like this is just such a complete team. I mean, it took me more time than almost any other squad to even come up with three team needs because truly <laughs> the Bills are in a great spot entering that 2021 season with Josh Allen still on that rookie deal. Sorry, right, let's move on to the gut feel round. We're recording this on February 2nd. So I know a lot can change, but just, you know, at this point in time, want to get your thoughts on these five topics. So first off, I love John Brown. Smokey, I mean, he's about, he, he had the Cardinals era where I think, uh, you know, he just battled some injuries, wasn't always 100%. Kind of happened again in 2020 overshadowed the great 2019 season he had obviously now Stefan Diggs is there Smokey would only cost 1.6 million in dead cap if the bills do decide to part ways with him this offseason do you think there's a way where John Brown is not on this roster in 2021 yes I expect him to not be on the team <sighs> I, I guess it's really a guess I have to admit that but I've been thinking through the season like he was hurt all year Ian like he, he he's good when he's good he's had a lot of that in his career he, he gave this team you know, night, a couple of nice seasons, but I would think with digs and if they're going to pay Allen and sort of looking ahead, it's really, it's really more, actually, it's more than more of a short-term question, but it doesn't have to happen. My gut feel is that he's gone, but I like him too. And Gabriel Davis was fine enough to step up. Yeah. If you need to make sacrifices and you already got him in the pipeline, I do get it. But yeah, at, at full health, John Brown's a lot of fun to watch. Hopefully he can get back to that in 2021. All right. Now with Josh Allen, I mean, Patrick Mahomes contract value, 450 million. Deshaun Watson is 156 million. Russell Wilson's 140 million. I mean, I don't know if the talks are going to, if you could speak about when you think these talks are going to eventually happen and kind of what price ceiling Josh Allen's looking at. That'd be great because we've seen, I mean, with the, this Cowboys Dak Prescott uh, saga, you would like to think that they'll lock up Josh Allen sooner rather than later. But as we find out, not always the case. 
Yeah, I feel strongly that they'll that they'll try to do that and that they'll probably be successful. Uh, I mean, it, you probably know, even without you don't have to be in Western New York to know like it is a fierce love affair here between <laughs> the player, the team and the fans all together. And so I think this is ownership style. I thought it before the season. I thought it was they had been to the playoffs last year and Allen was at the bottom of the league in in some stats. But I still thought at the end of 2020, they will want to sign him. Now, there are lots of reasons to want to, starting with his play. There's also Jared Goff and Carson Wentz and really understanding how fickle the league is. But, you know, I think – take me. I'm someone – I think I understand the league and the – the the mechanics and the strategy that would go into a lot of that stuff, but I would still be stunned and, and almost upset if they didn't make that move this year, knowing what happened with golf, knowing how fickle it is. I thought the chiefs game Ian, was an example of how a quarterback on about the highest level can look sort of average when you take away some of his advantages, that's receivers getting open all year, like his did. That's the scheme. And in that game, that did not materialize, and Allen was just okay. And I think that's kind of what happened with Goff and and Wentz, you know, in in a to a point anyway. So I I do think he'll get paid, and I I would expect it to be this summer. Yeah, and we had a great article up on PFF.com from Kevin Cole where he literally went through pretty much the last 20, 25 years of quarterbacks, and Josh Allen just made the single biggest third-year leap that we have ever seen. Now, they have added offensive linemen. They have added good wide receivers to do that. How much of that is Josh? How much is that is them? Whatever, the 2020 product, whoever you want to give the credit to was more than enough to, you know, compete for any sort of championship on offense. But, yes, it is a great point that, you know, how much of that was 2020, how much of that could be a sign of things to come. So I want to talk about that big, uh, you know, addition they added before last year. Obviously, Stefan Diggs won just amazing 2020 season. I think he deserves to be in any conversation among the league's top five wide receivers at this point. Looking at his contract, though, total, you know, five years, 72 million. It ranks just eighth among wide receivers. Are we looking at a potential situation where they try to sign him long term? Because I think digs like off the field issues are, you know, just far like people talk about them far too much. The guys, you know, uh, uh, any guys, anything but a locker room problem. I know his teammates love him. But for someone that, again, is anyone's idea of a top five wide receiver, do you think he could be asked to be paid like that sooner rather than later? Yeah, I would. I guess I, I will predict that he that he asks for that. I think, and you may know this better than I do. Like I don't really study this in too much depth, but I think that the right move with Diggs is to try to figure out a way to pay him big up front and then be able to get out of it in a couple of years without too much penalty. The, the Bills have been really smart at making deals like that. They've had contracts that look kind of egregious, and then you realize, oh, well, they can walk away after one or two years, and I think that's the, the smart approach. So I would think with Diggs, you want to capitalize on this right now you want to make it last for a couple of years. And then you get to a point where he starts to enter that age where you wonder, you know, that Julio Jones territory in maybe three years. So you want to play the numbers on that. I think you, you try to make him happy now and that's good for your team. And then you're also not setting yourself up for trouble on the other end. Yeah, it can get scary. Wide receiver position, we see the, the guys have a little bit longer careers, but you never want to have the uh, you know contract that is giving Ezekiel Elliott $16.6 million in 2026. Not saying Diggs is on any sort of similar trajectory, but as you know, you're saying, things can change in a hurry here when you add a couple years of, uh, of tread to the tires. Look, at, at least you know, as, in terms of Diggs, Ian, as opposed to Elliott, that, you, that he's actually good. <laughs> Right. You actually, you, you actually know that he's good. So you have proof of that. And then you want to act according with Elliot, you know, maybe we don't know that as well. Diggs is definitively a good, great, amazing yes. wide receiver. Please don't twist those words, everybody. All right, I want to look here at the defense for a second because Tremaine Edmonds, uh, Tremaine Edmonds, excuse me, another player from the 2018 class that should be due for a contract extension soon. I know Trey White's already getting the big deal. Linebacker, we see different teams kind of value it, uh, you know, just depending on their scheme and how much they really want to pay that position. Do you see Buffalo also making Edmonds one of the higher paid players among linebackers or could that be a situation where maybe they let him go test free agency when that time comes yeah that'll be close um i think milano will probably go this offseason to big money that the bills won't be able to commit and then edmonds is what a year away he's on the same timeline as allen he's super young you always hear that point in his defense but the contract doesn't care if he's younger than (laughs) the other guys on on in their fourth year like that doesn't matter 
Um, I think how he's used is interesting. I've heard arguments for having him more, be more of an edge rusher. So I think that's a really interesting player in the year ahead, figure out how they can utilize him better. There were times when he was really a force and there were times when it did not look like that. So I think maybe a lot is on the line for him this year financially. We'll see what else happens with the team, but I think that could go either way. Yeah, still just 22 years old. That is wild. I knew he was young, but did not quite realize that. And yeah, to your point, I mean, it is, we were talking about before, like how important it is to defend the pass these days. If you are a linebacker that maybe struggles a little bit in coverage, hey, if you can bring it back as a pass rusher, you know, like, uh, I know he plays safety, but like Jamal Adams, you know, if you can't cover guys, at least be able to get off the passer. It will be fun to see that, you know, potential progression in Edmonds game in 2021. All right, last bowl, not or last section here that I think will lead into your bowl call. Devin Singletary, Zach Moss, they basically split the load when both were healthy in 2020. You know, it's a situation where Josh Allen doesn't check down much. He takes off inside a 10-yard line. I don't think it's necessarily a team where a running back is set to thrive, but we also really haven't seen either guy break out as an elite guy. Talk to me about what you see this Buffalo Bills backfield looking like over the next year. Well, I am someone who in fantasy last year would say all the time, probably to you on our show as well, Moss is the only guy in this offense I like. Now, how did that prediction go? <laughs> I mean, really, I couldn't have done much worse. He was banged up a little bit, but yeah. Yes, but I didn't have Allen and Diggs on teams, and <laughs> I didn't win a lot. So I still think there's every reason to think they like Moss. It's one year. He got hurt. His season ended with an injury as Indianapolis in the playoffs. Singletary is kind of a different story. It's two years. They've not gotten the explosion out of him. They've never used him goal line. They have Allen for that. And then in the Kansas City game, he got benched. It ended up being TJ Yeldon in, in, in that game. Like they were just fed up, I guess. He had a drop. And I don't know. I don't know what Singletary's future looks like. I'd rather be on Moss than Singletary. Allen is still their best runner. Yeah. I mean, he, he's their best runner for touchdowns, seven for 88 in the Chief game, a lot on scrambles. I think maybe the number one strategic flaw in their game that day was not having him run the ball more and sort of open up Kansas City. They didn't do that. And the running back thing has never really happened here in a couple of years. I like, I like Moss. Okay. Going forward. I'm not off him. Singletary. I really don't want on teams. And I think there could be somebody new. They've done that every year. I mean, we had Chris Ivory in here. We had Frank Gore in here, fullbacks. So I think I would expect some sort of, they might be cheap too, Ian, right? In the market. Yeah. Like I would think there could be some player. Devontae Freeman was here at the end of this season. Uh, so I think so something like that is pro is likely, but Moss is my number one. Yeah. Now. I don't think, I don't think either guy is going to, you know, be going in the first five, six rounds or anything like that. But Moss might turn out to be one of these, you know, zero RB targets we want to look for when you load up early on the wide receivers. I agree with you. Like Singletary, he's fine, but it seems like he would have already gotten the featured role at this point. Moss now seems like the front runner to get that, if at all. But yes, in general, Josh Allen, engine of this offense, doesn't quite have time to enable too much of a fantasy friendly RB. All right, Mike, we'll get you out of here. But first, I need your offseason bull call. Well, I've, I'm sure you get bolder, but the perfect player for me for this offense is Curtis Samuel. Oh, I love it. They have Isaiah McKenzie, who's done kind of a gadget role, a little that whatever that's called, that little pass that should be should count as a run that play. Yeah, pop um, pass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pop pass, right? And Samuel, you can do so many different things. I, I would think that they would find a player like that appealing. I think he's the best player like that who will be out there. I mean, I think Hunter Henry is another reasonable idea, but it's kind of obvious. Um, they, they, Brandon Bean, the GM, said tight end was not a, a position, a threatening position for us. So I think the future at that position is very much in doubt. But, you know, he's the, he's the guy on that list, I think, and maybe there'll be a lot of competition for him. I don't know if that's true with Samuel, with so many teams, or so many receivers, rather, being available. So uh, what do you think of that fit? I absolutely love it. I, my wish list was for Curtis Samuel to go to the Packers potentially because I think just in terms of a total raw target volume, it could be a lot there. But I think this fits perfect. You're look, going to one of the most well-schemed offenses that could use, you know, this hybrid wide receiver running back threat like Curtis Samuel. And I think he can truly do everything on the football field. In 2019, like he got hated on because people were expecting a breakout. Like, and, and people try to say he was miscast as a field stretcher. Kyle Allen was miscast as a starting NFL quarterback nothing was wrong with Curtis Samuel repeatedly breaking wide open deep down the field we saw last year with Teddy Bridgewater under center which hey Josh Allen would obviously be a massive upgrade over that 
Kurt is plenty capable of working from the slot out wide, even in the backfield. So particularly if John Brown's leaving, I think Curtis just adds an entire new dimension to that and he can do pretty much everything Smokey was already doing. So I love that call. I am well credit you to that call, but I will be stealing that, encouraging <laughs> that to you down the, down yeah, the way. Bring, so bring them over to the bills. Everybody can go <laughs> to the Packers. We've had every idea for the Packers at wide receiver for two years. They'll who knows we'll be, we'll just be, we're just preparing to be disappointed again by <laughs> so naming, true. naming guys going to green Bay. <laughs> I was banging the drum for Robbie Anderson, the green Bay all off season last year, but you know what? They made the NFC championship anyway. So credit to right. Marquez, a ball scaling and those guys. All right, everybody, that's going to do it. Mike, thank you for the time. People can find you on Twitter at show talk again, S C H O P P talk. Let people know where you got the docker for the off season. Yeah, well, I hope I'm not a beat guy. I host a show Monday through Friday, three to seven Eastern time in Buffalo. I've got about 22 years doing that. Uh, with Chris Parker, the Bulldog, my partner. So we're there every day. Uh, it's a little bit of hockey this time of year, too, if you're into that. We don't do a lot of NBA or baseball, but um, although last year the major leagues were in Buffalo, Ian, as you may have heard with the Blue Jays, and who knows if that won't happen again. But it's, it's largely a football show year-round. Awesome. Everyone make sure you check that out. Truly talking to a legend of the industry here with Mike. He's Mike. I'm Ian. Thank you all for listening to the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. And until next time, take care, everybody.